You've heard about defense contractors who cheat the government. Well, meet one. He's in prison serving five years for the fraudulent testing of this little gadget, which is critical to the performance in battle of one of this country's most critical missiles. We have done testing and testing and testing on those transistors. But your testing was phony. It was not phony. That's why you're in prison. Why do you have an army? We are a neutral state, and to defend neutrality, you need a strong mean, a army. Who joins the Swiss army? Well, expertise in close order drill is not necessary. I'm Mike Wallace. I'm Morley Safer. I'm Harry Reasoner. I'm Ed Bradley. Those stories and Andy Rooney tonight on 60 Minutes. Is a tale of fraud admitted by a small defense contractor, a company that did only about $2 million worth of business a year with the Pentagon, but the military hardware they manufactured that went into the Harm missile was critical. So critical to the American defense effort that its failure in combat could put the lives of many American fighting men in danger. The fraud, the cheating, came out of this modest Southern California company, Genisco Technology Corporation. Genisco pled guilty to deliberately defrauding the Defense Department in the way it built and tested this crucial piece of military hardware. It is called a transducer and costs only about $300, but it is absolutely essential to the success of the harm missile a highly sophisticated air-to-ground missile designed to knock out enemy radar installations that control the fire of enemy anti-aircraft guns. The transducer is fitted into the harm missile and tells it how low or how high it is flying on its way to the target it aims to destroy. The Pentagon rates the harm one of the most important weapons in the U.S. arsenal. Inga Mortel has more than 25 years of experience designing missiles. A former jet fighter pilot, he was a consultant to the Navy on the harm missile. If a company turns out a faulty transducer, saying that it's good, mm -hmm. and it's installed in a harm missile, what is that company doing? Uh, well, obviously it is fraudulent, but to me it is, is worse than that. To me it is jeopardizing our airmen. It is sending them, some of them, or lots of them, needlessly to their death. Uh, to me it's treason. It truly is treason. Modell calls it treason because of what could happen to a pilot leading an attack and firing a harm missile at an enemy radar installation if the transducer fails. I would have no protection by the time I got to the target because the harm missile wouldn't work. Th therefore, you could be in serious danger. Therefore, either you or the strike force would be very vulnerable to that anti-aircraft missile battery that you have not got or destroyed. Steve Miller is a special agent for the Defense Department's Criminal Investigative Service. He learned from an informant that Janisco was cheating, so he opened a criminal case against Janisco. But he needed hard evidence of the company's wrongdoing. As we were working the case up, then we had a tremendous stroke of luck. We had a current employee who did not know there was an investigation going on walk in to complain about what was going on at Janisco. This is Roland, Roland Gibo. Why did you decide to turn whistleblower? Uh, Basically, because it just got to be too much. You cheated. Absolutely. Why? Gibault told the federal agents he was disgusted uh, with Janisco's cheating. I told them that I did not want to cheat, and I told them that I did not want to falsify any more documents. Gibault was able to provide examples of how Janisco cheated to Assistant U.S. Attorney Brian Hennigan. He told Hennigan that the plant manager, this man, Werner Brinkschulte, ordered him to deceive Navy inspectors who had selected two transducers for testing. Uh, Brink Schulte, uh, according to Mr. Chabot, looked at those transducers and said, these two will never pass the test. He pulled out two other transducers and said, test these, and you're going to have to change the serial numbers. Chabot said, change the serial numbers, that's, that's not what, what we've been asked to do. Chabot told the federal investigators he couldn't take it anymore, that he was quitting his job at Janisco. They said, please do not leave the Genesco plant. We need somebody on the inside to let us know what's going on in there. We fully don't know what's going on yet. So Gibault continued to work undercover at Genisco and fed Special Agent Steve Miller inside information about the chicanery that was going on. Finally, in February of 87, 
about 25 federal agents raided Genisco. It was a cathartic experience for the employees. They couldn't wait to talk to us. They said, oh, thank you, we've been waiting for someone to come in. But they wouldn't take that step to bring us in. At this moment, Pete Bernstein was one of the Genisco employees who agreed to cooperate. They asked you whose side you were on, and you said, uh, the right side, your side. Bernstein said the Genisco transducers were so poorly built that most of them flunked even the basic testing required by the Defense Department. But instead of junking those bad transducers, Bernstein was ordered to cheat, to tamper with the transducers to make them appear to meet specifications. If it wasn't in spec, they uh, had what they called stress redistribution tools, which were two dentist picks. Picks like these that your dentist commonly uses to clean your teeth. We had a straight dental probe and a curved dental probe. One would make the numbers go up and one would make the numbers go down. You would just stick it in, in the porthole and just scratch the diaphragm one way to make it go one way and uh, scratch it the other way to make the, the numbers go the other way. Even though scratching these transducers seemed to make them work in the tests, experts tell us that what the Genisco employees did with their dental picks damaged the transducers in such a way that they could never give accurate altitude readings. After the raid uncovered all these illegal practices, believe it or not, Genisco returned to its bad old ways. The supervisor named Danny Evans told the employees to get back to work. And uh, Mr. Evans, uh, according to what they told us, said, well, okay, guys, let's go back to uh, cheating as usual. They went right back to cheating. I couldn't believe it. I mean, I was... <laughs> I was uh, quite dumbfounded. Why were they cheating? Apparently because they did not have enough faith in their own ability to make a product that would uh, pass the test. To get an assessment of just how much damage Genisco had actually done, the Defense Department randomly selected 30 harm missile transducers from each of three production years. The result? All 90 transducers failed the testing. And Genisco had done more damage to other vital defense systems with its faulty transducers. Transducers in these Coast Guard rescue helicopters were supposed to monitor oil pressure. But transducer failures frequently grounded the choppers. Genisco transducers were also supposed to gauge the depth of these Navy underwater targets and torpedoes. The Navy tested the transducers and they all failed. The Navy said a failure like that could sink a ship. The government indicted Genisco and three management supervisors it said were responsible. Genisco and the supervisors, Werner brink -Schulte, Danny Evans, and Robert Kersnick, all pled guilty. The company paid a $725,000 settlement, and all three men were sentenced to prison terms. brink -Schulte, the man the government said was top dog in the cheating scandal, is now serving a five-year prison term. He was the only one of the three sentenced to the penitentiary who agreed to talk to us. Why did you submit fraudulent data, Mr. Brickshot? I believe it had something to do with the pressure that uh, was exerted by um, my superiors. At Genisco? At Genisco. Pressure to do what? Pressure to produce quick, turn, turn a profit uh, uh, in on a monthly basis the pressure from the customers to deliver on time. Why were you willing to phony to cheat on the tests on what I am led to believe, and I'm a novice about this, but what I am led to believe is a vital piece of equipment in the harm missile and in the helicopters and in the targets and in the torpedoes, but especially in the harm missile. Why were you willing to cheat under those circumstances? I'm at a loss to understand it, frankly, Mr. Brinkshaw. Because the cheating that was going on didn't make an inferior product. We simply didn't test properly. We did not make a bad product good by changing the paperwork. No, paperwork. you... you, you, you. <laughs> you furnished bad products that stayed bad. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Is it possible that improperly tested transducers are now in harm missiles that are deployed to the armed forces around the world? But of course. Improperly tested, yes. Does that make them bad? No. Not necessarily, but it doesn't necessarily make them good either. Yes, they are good. You don't we have know proven that. that. We have proven that. Where, where did you prove it? 
because we have done testing and testing and testing on those transducers. But your testing was phony. It was not phony. That's why you're in prison. It was not phony. Know, but this is not Alice in Wonderland. The you're only... here because you pled guilty. That's why you're here. That's correct. I pled you pled guilty. guilty to fraud and misrepresentation and cheating on testing. That's why you're here. And you pled guilty to fraud and misrepresentation and cheating on testing of transducers that went into the harm missile, among other things. That's why you're here. Yes. Did it never occur to you, Mr. Brickshaw, that one of these faulty transducers could lead to the death? of who knows how many airmen? No. It never occurred to you? No. How come? Because it, it's theoretically not possible. Missile experts tell me that it is. Men who have dealt with, with uh, missiles for 20, 25 years say it's treason, called it treason. I don't believe that, Mr. Wallace. Genisco had built the transducers for the giant Texas Instruments Company, the prime contractor for the Harm missile. Texas Instruments was supposed to monitor Genisco to make sure the company turned out an honest product. But federal agents tell us that Texas Instruments was lax in its oversight. Texas Instruments declined to speak to us on camera. Chairman John Dingell of the House Energy and Commerce Committee has investigated the whole affair. The hard fact of the matter is that uh, there's good evidence that Texas Instruments began to be aware of defects in this particular system back as early as 1982. So far, Texas Instruments has pulled about 200 bad Genisco transducers out of harm missiles. But the government has not forced the company to remove about 900 more suspect transducers still in the harms, even though Texas Instruments admits that these transducers have never been properly tested by anyone. All of them were made in the same process by the same people under the same circumstances. One lot of 90 failed 100% just after it had been tested by Texas Instruments after it was procured by the Navy. But these could put a combat airman, let us say, in harm's way. They could endanger the life of a combat airman. There's an old statement that came from an admiral in the British Navy that said a man who goes into combat with weapon systems that don't work is a fool. And the man that sends him in with those kinds of systems is a scoundrel. I'm sure, Mr. Brinkshaw, that you have no desire to see a combat airman lose his life because of a... Of course not. But uh, in, the, in the crush of getting product out, of pleasing your superiors, you cut corners. That's correct. We cut corners. Which leads to the question, who else is cutting corners? Southern California is honeycombed with defense contractors. How many more companies out there conduct their business like Genisco? Rod Hansen is special agent in charge of the area for the Defense Department's Criminal Investigative Service. We would like to say Genesco is the exception. Uh, unfortunately, it's not. Over the last three years, there's been over 200 indictments in the area of product substitution, false testing, false certification. And Mr. Hansen says there are 600 of these investigations now pending across the country. problem. This is a security threat as we speak, built right into what has been touted as one of our most trusted weapons systems. What went wrong? Well, a major 2020 investigation reveals some of the answers, and what may really astound you in Tom Jarrell's report is that in this instance, the way we make some of our nuclear weapons seems almost amateurish. For as long as aircraft have been used in the defense of nations, strategic planners have tried to develop a smart weapon, one that could guide itself to a target. After a well-publicized crash program in the 1970s, the U.S. unveiled it. The cruise missile, one of the smartest weapons in the U.S. arsenal. The 20-foot-long cruise is a nuclear-armed, pilotless plane, flying low and slow to avoid enemy radar. Countdown's beginning. Theoretically, you can tell it where to go, 
program in a map, and it will find its own way. Missile away indications. The cruise missile can change direction to correct course or avoid an obstacle. And in early tests in the late 1970s, the cruise missile was given an A for accuracy. Cruise missiles can be launched from the ground and from ships at sea. Our story is about the air-launched cruise missiles deployed on strategic bombers on patrol 24 hours a day. Our whole defenses depend upon accuracy and reliability of these weapons. Without air-launched cruise missiles, our whole one leg of the triad, the air leg of the triad, the bomber leg of the triad, would be in deep, deep question. Boeing Corporation is the prime contractor for the air-launched cruise missile. They assemble components made by at least 28 subcontractors, including the Northrop Corporation, which is the subject of our investigation. Northrop, with its corporate headquarters in Los Angeles, is one of the nation's biggest defense contractors, with huge contracts to work on well-known projects, like the controversial stealth bomber. They have tens of thousands of employees nationwide, but this report involves only a few less than 50 in one small facility located east of Los Angeles. Small, yes, but their work was crucial involving the guidance system on the nuclear-tipped air-launched cruise missile. At this isolated plant in Pomona, Northrop employees assemble flight data transmitters for all of the air-launched cruise missiles, more than 1,700 of them. The flight data transmitter, or FDT, is a small seal box, five by three inches, weighing about two pounds packed with gyroscopes, circuit boards, and other electronic gear. The flight data transmitter goes in the front of the missile with the rest of the guidance system. It's the brain of the cruise missile, fine-tuning the course set by the autopilot. If the FDT fails, the missile drifts off course, carrying its 200 kiloton nuclear warhead out of control. Precise work on this component is so crucial, the Air Force requires stringent testing to military standards. The purpose is to make sure that the gyros and circuit boards in the FDT are absolutely reliable under a variety of extreme conditions. From the time the air-launched cruise missile went into production in 1981, the Pomona plant was under pressure to meet monthly quotas. Boeing was determined to produce the missiles ahead of schedule, and they did. But former Northrop employees charged the way they met the deadlines was by taking shortcuts. Until they finally blew the whistle, no one had noticed. Now Congress, the Air Force, and the Department of Justice are conducting separate inquiries, trying to determine what happened and how much damage has been done. What we've learned over the past year in our investigation will not reassure you. To begin with, investigators have found so many problems with the flight data transmitters and the air launch cruise missiles, they don't know which ones will work and which ones won't. The problems begin with charges of fraud and the basic testing required for every FDT. Problem number one, cheating to meet technical standards. Leo Barajas was a test engineer on the flight data transmitter. Were you ever uh, involved in the falsification of test of data that went to indicate some of these parts were working? When they weren't? Yes, uh, sometimes when parts would fail. They just tell me to, to go ahead and uh, get uh, good recordings from previous tests and rip off the identification on them on top of the tape. It was really easy to do, just ripping them off and re-identify it, and that way nobody would ever know that uh, there was ever a failure. So that was deliberate falsification of yes. the test? Yes. Baraha showed us how it was done. The results of successful tests were attached to reports on equipment which had failed. It was a simple cut-and-paste fraud. Another employee says to make this scam work, they rigged up extra machines to make spare copies of successful test results. Even though the falsification would have been easily detectable, Baraha says it was done at least a hundred times and was never caught. Mm -hmm. You have a failure there. Okay, so that would be a failure. And that's not all. The federal government has identified the serial numbers of over 600 flight data transmitters they allege were improperly tested, failed testing, or weren't tested at all in violation of military standards. How could such an apparent wide-scale fraud go on and not be caught? Because of problem number two, bypassing the inspectors. Besides testing, each unit had to be individually inspected by a certified technician before it was packed and shipped to Boeing. That was Pat Meyer's job. Did you find any problems? Did uh, you find problems frequently or infrequently? I found a lot of problems. 
there was a unit that uh, had a damaged board on it, and I couldn't believe that they would let anything like that go out the door. What was wrong with it? It was uh, burnt about the size of a 50 cent piece on about a two and a half to three inch board. They closed it up and sealed it? Yes, and shipped it that day. So it somewhere today could be in a cruise guidance system? Yes, it could. That kind of damaged circuit board could eventually cause the entire unit to fail. Pat Meyer says she wrote discrepancy or squawk reports on these problems. But in the rush to get the units out the door, the plant manager or the chief engineer would often override her reports of substandard parts by just noting, use as is. These initials, CG, overriding her report, belong to none other than the plant manager, Clarence Gonzalves. Committee will come to order. Later, a Northrop vice president claimed to Congress the company had no idea what was going on. Mr. Lynch, why was it that the people at the Pomona plant didn't go to the manager with the complaints on these matters? Well, unfortunately, sir, the manager of the plant was involved in the decisions to falsify the, or alter or not perform the test. So this was being done under the, not with the knowledge of and the direction of the manager. He's talking about the manager, Gonzalves. He put this woman, Cheryl Hannon, in charge of quality assurance. She was a low-level technician in the plant, but was quickly promoted by Gonzalves to a top post. Gonzalves, Hannon, Chief Engineer Howard Hyde, and two other employees were indicted in April for knowingly falsifying tests and providing the government with flight data transmitters that might not work. Also named in the criminal indictment, the Northrop Corporation itself. The two employees who blew the whistle on all these problems say they reported them to Northrop management over four years ago and nothing changed. In fact, Leo Barajas and Pat Meyer say they were fired because of their efforts to clean things up. Northrop said Pat Meyer took too much time off and Leo was fired for his role in falsifying tests. They got a lawyer and are suing Northrop. Now, basically what you're talking about is the, the temperature chambers. The... Their attorney, Herbert Half, conducted his own investigation. He says that because the whistleblower's reports were ignored, the Air Force has found substandard flight data transmitters in air launch cruise missiles today. When the Air Force took them apart, and they're lying if they say different, our sources are better than anybody's sources. They're lying if they say different. When they took them apart, they found the quality of workmanship exactly as we alleged. It was sloppy. And they can't guarantee these things will work. They won't. Attorney Half and his team of detectives found another problem, the third so far, one that's been neglected by other investigators. There was another source of shoddy workmanship, a plant run by a sub subcontractor known as Fuzzy for his long hair. Fuzzy had a contract from Northrop to assemble circuit boards that went into the flight data transmitter. His plant, located on an alley, was known to Northrop employees as Fuzzy's Garage. Circuit boards are the nerve center of the FDT and have to be carefully wired by hand to exact specifications. Florence Castaneda remembers trying to repair Fuzzy's circuit boards. They were flawed. Circuitry used to lift up. And when they had to change a part, the circuitry used to break off. Were these bad parts that came in from Fuzzy's garage thrown in the trash can, or did they go into the cruise missile? They went into the cruise missile. These inspection documents show the parts did end up in the cruise missile. The real name of Fuzzy's company was Quality Assurance Manufacturing. The company was sent Northrop parts and instructions to assemble them by the book. Pat Meyer also saw problems with fuzzy circuit boards. Everything from reverse parts to solder shorts to lifted pads to damaged parts to reverse parts to everything. So this was shoddy workmanship. <laughs> oh, very. We wanted to see this fuzzy's garage and we found it. Located on a back alleyway in North Hollywood, California, amid the dumpsters and auto body repair shops. But when we got here, fuzzy had moved out. The missile makers had been replaced by a team manufacturing something more down to earth. This is what we found, rock musicians. When the band Triangle moved in, Fuzzy was gone. But he had left some interesting things behind. Transformers, connectors, 
special high-tech electrical wire scattered all over the shop. We found records showing they were Northrop property. Official government inspection stickers required for use in military products were found lying all around. The boys in the band threw out most of their electronic discoveries while house cleaning, but not all of it. They wired some of the abandoned parts into their amplifiers. Components which could have been destined for use in a cruise missile, today are pounding out a hot rock and roll beat. Fuzzy's Garage, also known as Quality Assurance Manufacturing, was set up by Fuzzy, whose real name is Charles George, and Northrop employee Jean Porter. Jean Porter told us she gave approval for her own company to be a Northrop subcontractor, a clear conflict of interest. She, in effect, hired herself. We tracked Fuzzy, Mr. Charles George, to his new company, and at first got a runaround. Is Mr. George in, please? Um, no, he's not. We wanted to ask George about the way Quality Assurance Manufacturing had gotten its contract with Northrop, and about charges he had provided them with substandard parts for the cruise missile. But he promptly showed us the door. Thank you very much. You understand what we're trying to find I out? I sure do. Thank you very much. the Northrop much. work you did. Yes. Can you talk to us at all about it? No, thank you. Nothing at all. Okay. Dr. Robert Costello is the former weapons procurement chief at the Pentagon. When you hear about a system that uh, has been penetrated by something like Fuzzy's Garage, what do you think? You could uh, seriously degrade the system. It costs you lots by the time you're done. In what way? Because you're not aware of the reliability. And you may have a part that's defective. When we told the chairman of the House Armed Services Committee about Fuzzy's Garage, he said, that's not an acceptable way to make a missile. If you pr are producing these products under any conditions other than the most extremely uh, well-organized conditions, I mean, you end up with something that you don't know where that missile is going to go uh, when you fire it. And for the problem-laden cruise missile guidance system, there's one final outrage. In severely cold temperatures, the flight data transmitters may not work at all. Because of their strategic importance, the air launch cruise missiles must work even when launched under extreme conditions that could average 65 degrees below zero. But Northrop had used the wrong liquid in the FDT gyros by mistake. In extreme cold, the gyros may ice up, freeze, and be useless. But because of the fraudulent testing, workers in the Pomona plant never caught this error. Two years ago, Congressman Les Aspen ordered a congressional investigation into the whole problem of FDT testing. That prompted this Air Force response to Aspen, reporting on a sample inspection of 31 FDTs. Seven failed inspection, that's over 20%. But the Air Force claimed none of the seven deficiencies would have prevented mission accomplishment. Do you believe that? I they expect that. you to believe that? I, I, I don't know whether they expect us to believe it or not, but it's, it's just not credible. But for now, the Air Force admits all flight data transmitters in air launch cruise missiles have to be considered suspect. So the apparent cheating by a few people working on just one missile guidance part has spread like a virus into missiles positioned throughout the entire air launch cruise program. The worst part is you don't know. If you knew that these didn't work and these worked, at least you'd know what you had. The problem with this system is you don't know and that is very unnerving. Yeah. Tom, what are we looking at here? Massive incompetence or, or venality beyond our wildest imaginings? Hugh, it appears to be less a matter of uh, personal greed as a motive uh, rather than people working under enormous pressures to meet a deadline and compromising a lot. Uh, but still on a missile system this important to our national defense with the amount of money that went into the cruise missile, it's inexcusable. All right. What do you think is the future of the cruise missile? Major, uh, in that a couple of other major nuclear delivery systems, the stealth and the advanced crews are being cut by Congress as far as funding is concerned. We're going to have to depend on this missile. We should point out, too, Northrop and the Air Force declined to talk to us because of criminal trials which are pending. All right. Thank you, Tom. Well, later in the hour, the past, present, and 